concerns over needed pesticides for agriculture sector. TIPNG calls for transparency in central rice project decisions. And RSPCA gets much needed new clinic. Concerns over needed pesticides for agriculture sector. TIPNG calls for transparency in central rice project decisions. And RSPCA gets much. Concerns over needed pesticides for agriculture sector. TIPNG calls for transparency in central rice project decisions. And RSPCA gets much needed new clinic. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening, this is Saturday's News and thanks for joining us. Agriculture Minister Benny Allen says the agriculture sector is facing problems in importing pesticides. Minister Allen says the foreign exchange rate is not allowing the sector to import the quantity the sector needs. He says this does not help when two leading commodities are currently under threat from two different insect pests. With the announcement of threats by the coconut rhinoceros beetle and coffee berry borer, the agriculture sector is now looking at options to minimize or control the harmful effects it can have on coffee, oil palm and coconut. The agriculture minister says the current economic reality faced in the country does not help with the importing of pesticides from abroad. The bank cannot uh, give us enough uh, foreign currency to, to import, uh, import uh, the chemicals from overseas. So that has been our problem at the moment. For the coffee berry borer, government agency Coffee Industry Corporation is working closely with farmers in Eastern Islands and Jiwaka to control the spread of the disease. Uh, at the moment they are, they are doing the cuttings, huh? stamping. They are, they are cutting down the trees affected trees in those areas. With the sector seeing another threat with the presence of the coconut rhinoceros beetle, Vice Minister Henry Ames says it will be an expensive exercise to save the sector. So this will take uh, you know, some time, but uh, you know, we hope that you know, one day we, we will reach our goal and try to uh, have a good uh, you know, a crop that without any uh, effect from pest and disease. However, talks between CIC and a foreign company will see the shipping of a limited quantity of chemicals into the country. The agriculture minister says this is the option awaiting funding from the 2018 national budget. At the moment, uh, CIC has arranged with a company in, uh, in Japan. The company is called MG Corporation. That company has decided to supply chemicals without any payment, uh, uh, and payment can be sorted out at a later uh, date when... Jack Lopave, Jr., National MTV News. Agriculture Minister Benny Allen says the multi-million central rice project is temporarily suspended due to quota disagreements between importers. Minister Allen said that is now before the Attorney General and State Solicitor before a report is compiled and presented to the National Executive Council. It has been over two years since the project was launched in Central Province. 
we are not stopping it. What we have is just the two issues that need to be uh, uh, sorted out. Like we said before, the quota, the 80 percent quota that Naime is asking for, and the uh, tax concession they are also asking for. Uh, ten year, you know, tax holiday. Yeah, ten year. Uh, so we need to address those two issues. So those two issues has been uh, have been, been uh, raised with the uh, AG, a state so, and we are still waiting for them to give us a, a clearance. Transparency International Papua New Guinea is calling on the Minister for Agriculture and the National Government to ensure that decisions concerning the Central Province Rice Project are transparent and open to the public. Agriculture and Livestock Minister Benny Allen says the government was in the process of reviewing the Naime Rice Project in Central Province. TIPNG Chairman Lawrence Stevens, in response, says Papua New Guineans are entitled to know why their government is risking their access to food by bringing in a company that was registered only seven years ago, has not grown a single grain of rice, and is suspected to have ties to former Indonesian fugitive Joko Chandra. TIPNG is calling on Minister Allen to be open and inclusive to all views before making this important decision. You're watching National MTV News. Among stories after the break, Telecom HQ sets up Cadova BM Relief Collection and RSPCA gets new clinic. Stay tuned for that. Welcome back to the news. In news just in, another nasty accident has happened outside Leigh today. A PMV bus and a vehicle belonging to a construction company collided outside Leigh's 8 Mile. Initial reports indicate that several people are seriously injured. Police arrived moments later to clear traffic and allow those injured to be transported to the hospital for treatment. The accident is the second in a space of a month. Telecom PNG has joined other members of the business community in lending support towards the Cadova relief. Telecom PNG staff through the Telecom Foundation have set up a relief box at their Waigani headquarters for the Cadova BM volcano relief. Acting Telecom CEO Xavier Victor was on hand yesterday during the launch of the Cadova BM relief appeal at Telecom headquarters. The appeal was initiated by telecom staff and management. Uh, partnership with the uh, Telecom Foundation and uh, uh, volunteers of uh, telecom, uh, uh, with the employees of telecom, uh, have come together to uh, uh, come up with an initiative to unveil or set up a uh, collection box here uh, that uh, we will be collecting from not only the employees of uh, telecom, but from people within the, uh, and our tenants here in Telecom Romana and also from within the Waigani precinct, uh, the government departments here and, and business houses that uh, have offices around here. We want to open this uh, uh, place up for, for them to bring the collections and, uh, and, and contribute towards a cause that uh, we think uh, will, will support and assist our people uh, in that part of the, uh, the country. Mr. Victor recognized the urgent need for basic supplies like food, clothing and hygiene products while making mention of the long-term work for resettlement on mainland is SIPIC. It is only fair as a Papua New Guinea company that we initiate such initiative and, uh, and, and go towards supporting our, 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 our people that are affected by uh, natural disaster. Uh, so that's what we want to do. It's not a competitive thing. I think it is a community thing that we want to, uh, we want to take and we don't uh, want to claim anything out of that. We just want to make sure that we are there to support our people uh, in the time of need. Cash donations are encouraged to be deposited in the designated Cadova Relief Bank account set up by the East Pacific Provincial Government, now shown on your screen. Godwin Eki, National MTV News. A mother of three is appealing to the public for donation in cash or kind after their home was gutted by fire. 
Elsie Pavia from Western Province told MTV News of the fire that burnt down their home at Morbe Block in the Port Moresby South Electorate. She says the only thing she could have she could save on that night were her three children and her certificates. So I gathered the three children into a bed sheet and pulled them outside. I went to my belongings again, but the fire was so hot and I got scared. I only got my certificates and work papers from the Eski Kula and ran out. The family now appeal for donation to support families, two families and rebuild the house again. Toro Games has officially reopened this morning at Garden City's ground level. Managing Director Henry Torbett Jr. is excited to see young individuals come ready to play. Tournaments happen on Saturdays and winners get to win great prizes including cash. 60, Xbox One, and Managing Director Henry Torbett Jr. was excited to see young people coming in ready to play this morning. After relocating from Waigami, Toro Games is now officially open at Garden City from Monday to Saturday. And yeah, we saw good numbers, good turnout of people. And we thought, oh, maybe, you know, we can actually open a shop and have a, pre have a presence in Moresby so that our gamers can come straight to, straight to us anytime. Lohia Mero is a gamer who came a bit late to register this morning but is happy to be hanging out with his friends. Uh, a lot of people play here, so let's come and scope out and probably hop in a few matches. Bernard Ipoki is a dedicated gamer who absolutely loves the thrill of playing. He is happy that Toro Games is open, and he was waiting around because he is one of the champions who will be competing in the finals. Uh, growing up, I had friends who had video game consoles, and I kind of grew up into it. Like everywhere, not everywhere I went, but it was something that really caught my attention. And the more I began to play, the more I got indulged in it. I became actually pretty good at it, and I kind of sparked that competitive spirit inside me. <laughs> and ever since then, I've been frequently entering the local tournaments. Lillian Kinea, National MTV News. The Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, or RSPCA, has just begun building a new clinic with offices and a cattery. This is good news for all animals and pet owners around PNG. RSPCA is the only private vet clinic in PNG and operates their clinic, shelter, pound management and education program purely from donations, fundraising, business support and clinic fees. RSPCA has just begun the building of its new clinic. This will see more office space for staff and a new cattery for cats. Towards the end of 2017, a new hospital for animals that are sick and recovering from surgery was completed. We're building a new clinic, so we're going to actually have a brand new facility, something we haven't had ever. So uh, our vets are going to be very, very lucky. They're all going to have their own individual treatment areas, we're going to have a new laboratory in there, uh, we'll have uh, space for, for tr actually treating animals as well as just giving them the injections and things that they normally have. So it's really exciting, work has just started so uh, it doesn't look like much at the moment but we hope by the end of April we will have our new facility. RSPCA is the only private vet clinic in PNG. It offers a wide variety of services, including surgery and boarding for animals whose owners are traveling. They're worming, all those sorts of things for, for any um, surgeries, any um, uh, treatments that need to be done. We have a hospital as well, um, so animals can stay here while they recuperate. Uh, we have um, uh, what is with the boarding service that I just told you about, so uh, people can leave their pets here. We're usually very, very busy here over Christmas because a lot of people go on leave at, at Christmas time. So we have lots of little furry babies that come and come and stay with us, uh, and uh, we also have an adoption program. So our guys go out and uh, pick up stray dogs off the street, sick, sick ones, and 
uh, and, um, and strays. So if they're really, really sick, they will be humanely put to sleep and we try and rehome all the others. So not an easy job uh, at all. But RSPCA also has the Adopt a Pet program. Last year saw 70 cats and 73 dogs adopted into new homes. This is Debbie, who is still in dire need of a new home. Animals who stay more than a year have been put to sleep if they don't find a home. Helen White says that the number of animals continues to increase, but they want to be able to care for all. Um, we've currently got about 40 dogs and about 47 cats that are all looking for new homes. So if people want to come down and have a look and meet them, they can and hopefully add a furry friend to their household. And, uh, and uh, we, we love playing with the animals. So, I mean, I'm sure that people at home, it enhances their lives, it enhances the, the lives of the animals. Uh, and uh, it's just a wonderful thing to have a, have a pet in your life. Lillian Kinea, National MTV News. You're at Saturday's News. We'll have a look at what's happening overseas when we come back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the news. Turning overseas, U.S. President Donald Trump was in Davos for the World Economic Forum and addressed CEOs of global companies that America is ready to do business with them. Amongst that, the president got booed by international press for his fake news comments and was questioned on his recent controversial comments on African countries. The president continued his attacks on the press in Davos, grumbling that he no longer receives the favorable coverage he enjoyed as a celebrity. As a businessman, I was always treated really well by the press. You know, the numbers speak and things happen, but I've always really had a very good press. And it wasn't until I became a politician that I realized how nasty, how mean, how uh, vicious, and how fake the press can be as the cameras start going off in the back. <laughs> Despite that cry of fake news, the president remarked without any evidence that there would have been a stock market crash had Hillary Clinton been elected. Had the opposing party to me won, some of whom you backed, some of the people in the room, instead of being up almost 50 percent, the stock market is up since my election almost 50 percent. Uh, rather than that, I believe the stock market from that level, the initial level, would have been down close to 50 percent. The president came to Davos to take credit for the booming American economy, calling on companies across the world to move to the U.S. America is the place to do business. So come to America where you can innovate, create and build. But that welcoming tone came with a vow to start controlling the number of immigrants entering the U.S. based on new criteria. We must replace our current system of extended family chain migration with a merit-based system of admissions that selects new arrivals based on their ability to contribute to our economy, to support themselves financially, and to strengthen our country. Dream Act now! Dream Act now! The president also warned Democrats to accept a White House deal to protect undocumented immigrants brought to the U.S. as children known as the Dreamers from deportation. Mr. Trump tweeted Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer took such a beating over the government shutdown that he's unable to act on immigration. But there were reminders in Davos that the president's own behavior has also had an impact. Sitting with the president of Rwanda, Mr. Trump was asked about his comment that immigrants from Africa come from shithole countries. Alexei Nanvali, Russia's opposition leader, has been banned from running for elections. But this hasn't stopped him as he leads a campaign to boycott the Russian election. The Putin regime is built on corruption, and Putin himself is the most corrupt. His family is directly involved in corruption. According to official data, over 20% of our population lives below the poverty line. And people link the obvious. Why are we so poor? Because they steal so much. Regardless of the, of the popularity of, of that issue, um, you have been prevented from standing in these forthcoming uh, presidential elections. Now, do you think that Vladimir Putin is 
genuinely concerned or fearful of you as a political opponent? He is scared of all real competition. We see in these elections that he only allowed those to run who do not even resist, do not even do any campaigning. When they saw that we are actually fighting for people's votes, they got scared. The famous Putin's ratings, all these 86%, 70%, all of that the sociologists and political analysts love to talk about. They exist in only one scenario, when Putin places the candidates he controls. But that issue of polling numbers, I think, is, is important because, as you say, Vladimir Putin is polling more than 80% popularity in this country, if you believe the opinion polls, but, but you're polling just 2%. I mean, how much of a political threat does your movement really pose to this Kremlin juggernaut? Look, I stood for election just once in my life. In 2012, I participated in the Moscow mayor elections, and everyone was showing me polls when I had 2%. And without money or any media support, I got almost 30%. Same thing goes for the presidential elections. Putin doesn't have an 80% rating. He has an 80% rating when compared to other candidates, whom he has let run. As we now approach the election season, well, we're already in the election season, as we approach the election, what, what are you going to do? What's your plan to try and get yourself on the ballot, to try and promote your cause? Or have you abandoned all hope at this stage of standing in this election? We urge all Russians to join a voters' strike, not just refusing to vote, but campaigning so others don't vote as well. We are actively organizing this boycott, and this is the reason why we are being raided every day and our staff are being attacked. As the leading uh, opposition figure in Russia, you've, you've been harassed. You get regular visits from the, uh, the authorities, the police, the, the other inspectors. You've been insulted uh, widely, um, and, and of course you've been attacked. How concerned are you in a country like this, where opposition figures have been killed in the past, how concerned are you about your own safety and security? I'm a reasonable man. I ran my election campaign for 12 months, and out of these months I spent two in prison. So I have a clear understanding of what this regime can do. But I'm not afraid and I'm not going to give up on what I want to do. I won't give up on my country. I won't give up on my civil rights. I won't give up on uniting those around me who believe in the same ideals as me. And there are quite a lot of people like that in Russia. Floodwaters in Paris are threatening to damage 100 pieces of valuable art. The City of Love has come to a standstill as floodwaters have affected transport and walkways in the city. The statue of a soldier near the Pont d'Almon is Paris's unofficial flood guide. The waters of the River Seine, usually below his feet, have risen to his thighs. Weeks of heavy rains have caused the Seine to spill over onto nearby roads and flood the city's iconic riverbank walkways. The soggy conditions are making it tough for commuters and tourists alike to move about the city. The famous tourist boats, the Bateau Mouches, have stopped running. Popular metro stations with stops at the Eiffel Tower and the Musée d'Orsay have been suspended and a main train line has been disrupted. Rail officials say keeping everyone safe is their main concern. We know it's going to get worse, so we are very watchful. We are, have to be very vigilant so that uh, there won't be any problem, electrical system problem, uh, on all our lines. So far, the floods haven't shut down Paris's museums, though they are taking emergency preparations. And the Louvre has closed off an entire wing. Nearly two years ago, when the Seine swelled to similar levels, the Louvre was forced to evacuate 35,000 pieces of art. The new floods come as Paris is just finishing repairs from the last. And the city's deputy mayor warns there's probably more to come. Two flooding of the Seine River in less than two years. We have to change. We have to change the way we built this city. We have to, um, to understand that uh, climatic change is not a word, it's a reality. But in true Paris style, many residents are nonchalant about weathering the waters this weekend. We already have this uh, uh, big uh, amount of water. So I'm not really surprised, but it's always uh, 
uh, crazy to see this. It's dangerous, but uh, not like uh, it's not the uh, end of the life. So <laughs> just need to be, pay attention and be careful. Former U.S. Olympic doctor Larry Nessa is heading to prison for up to 175 years following his convictions for sexual abuse. But more heads could roll if the spotlight shifts to Nessa's older employees and the institution connected to him. I've just signed your death warrant. After 156 victims had addressed their abuser, Judge Rosemarie Aquilina got her turn. Your decision to assault was precise calculated, manipulative. Before Aquilina imposed the sentence, Larry Nasser addressed her and his victims. There are no words that can describe the depth and breadth of how sorry I am for what has occurred. Judge Aquilina did not buy Nasser's apology, reading aloud parts of the letter he had written to her last week. What I did in the state cases was medical, not sexual. The media convinced them that everything I did was wrong and bad. They feel I broke their trust. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Oh. The judge told Nasser his treatments were not medical and reminded him he had admitted wrongdoing in his plea deal. Because you are guilty, aren't you? As the procession of victims came to a close, Rachel Denhollander called for the maximum sentence. So I ask, how much is a little girl worth? I submit to you that these children are worth everything. She was the first to publicly accuse Nasser of sexual abuse in a 2016 Indianapolis Star article. You started the tidal wave. You are the bravest person I have ever had in my courtroom. Kaylee Lorenz says she was only 13 years old when Nasser first abused her. You need to look at me and listen. I only hope that when you get a chance to speak, you tell us who knew what and when they knew it. Nasser's abuse did not occur in a vacuum. A culture was in place where children were afraid to say no to a grown-up and where complaints were not taken seriously. As Judge Aquilina said today, there needs to be a massive investigation to find out how this happened. You're tuned in to National MTV News this Saturday. Chukai Sports is up next and it's a challenging time for our national teams in union and cricket. Details in Chukai Sports up next. Tukai Sports. Welcome to Tukai Sports. The PNG Palai scored their first try of the weekend, though losing to Japan 41 to 5. The Palais put up a good fight against Japan, but ball handling errors played a critical role in their loss. Allowed to compete on her feet and Kawa's done well there. She's held Japan were the first to score, putting them side. seven points in front. Ball, though. It's down and it's a try, says the referee Ben Kraus. Penji struck back with a try from Captain Debbie Kaure, running 18 meters to score. The charge. Papua New Guinea get their first try in Sydney. About time. An unsuccessful conversion kick saw the scores at 5-7. Japan replied a minute after, scoring through Chiharu Nakamoro and extending their lead by nine points. Chiharu Nakamura gets Japan's second of the game. Mifuyu Koida and Fumiku Otake added another two tries to extend Japan's lead at halftime. Back inside from Hirano. Off that was a good one, almost at the line. PNG tried attacking in the second half, but were shut down by Japan's defense. The youngster from Papua New Guinea. PNG was tryless in the second half, with Sayaka Suzuki getting a double and Chisato Yoko scoring three tries for Japan. Chance here for Japan. The offload is good. Almost at the line. And they're over. The final score, PNG 5, Japan 41. Elijah Levet, National MTV Sports. The PNG Book Book suffered another loss to England in the Sydney Sevens tournament in Australia. They lost 35 points to 5. Eventually get players there. 
The Pukpuks were one man short early in the match after Himak Alu was sin binned after a high tackle on an English player. Here's another look at the spear tackle. Yellow card, are you serious, Willie really Lossay? That's red every day of the week. England scored early in the match to lead 5 0. Dan Beebe then crossed over the try line to score England's second try. A successful conversion kick saw the scores at 14 0. Tom Mitchell. England crossed over right on halftime to extend their lead through Richard De Carpentier. Halftime score 21 0. Seven's highest try scorer, Dan Norton, added another five points for England after a brilliant solo try early in the second half, bringing his total number of tries to 274. He is something else. England extended the lead through Tom Mitchell, bringing the score up to 35 nil. Holds it up for Mitchell, slices him open. Tom Mitchell has his second. PNG had a chance to get their first points of the match through Alu, but he was tackled 10 meters short of the line and was held on too long by English player Oliver Lindsay Haig, resulting in Haig being sinbinned. PNG chasing their first try on this one. That'll be a penalty. Tackle release. The man's trying to get to his feet. Clear call. Right on full time, Manu guys crossed over the English line to put PNG on the board. First try of the game is guys. Oh, it's frenetic stuff and PNG. Final score, England 35, PNG 5. Elijah Levet, National MTV Sports. Updates on the Under-19 Cricket World Cup. The PNG Garmots have given their all by winning the East Asia Pacific qualifiers early last year to get to the World Cup. But their attempts to come out with at least a win, if not a title, are proving to be a major struggle. Four straight losses in the Group B matches against India, Australia and Zimbabwe, not to mention the warm-up match defeats against West Indies and host New Zealand has sent the PNG outfit into frenzy in their struggle to stay in competition. Like the rest that are at this world event, the Garamos are young and inexperienced, but it is fair to say that in contrast, PNG Under-19's level of cricketing is still playing catch-up to the world. The losses in the pool matches meant PNG had to fall back to compete in the plate finals in which they are yet to record a win. And they came short of yet another win by 80 runs in the plate quarter-final match against Canada a week ago. Battered but not out, they took on Ireland on Friday in what turned out to be the seventh straight defeat. Ireland put up a 122 runs margin between them to back the win. For now, they prepare to take on Kenya in the final attempt to secure a win. Dinero Strico, National MTV Sports. You're watching Chukai Sports. We'll have more for you after the short messages. Stay tuned. <laughs> True Kai Sports. Welcome back to True Kai Sports. To the Under 19's Cricket World Cup, New Zealand is looking down the barrel at a monster running chase against Afghanistan in the quarter final. Afghanistan winning the toss and electing to bat before taking it to the New Zealand bowlers with some clinical stroke play. The Kiwis letting their opponents off the hook with a series of dropped catches as they decimated New Zealand's bowling attack to reach 100 runs before the 20th over. A bowling change then finally breaking Afghanistan's opening partnership. Seam position. Chopped on. Sandeep Patel ends the agony of this opening partnership. A short time ago, Afghanistan were 142 for two after 28 overs. An 11-year-old table tennis player from Cardiff has been named in the Welsh Commonwealth Games team. It's believed she's the youngest competitor ever to be selected. Anna Hersey has earned her place in the Wales Commonwealth team. Practicing three hours a day after school, the 11-year-old has already proven her skills. She won her first senior international a year ago. Anna is no stranger to competition, but this will be her biggest challenge yet. Yeah, I feel really special, really proud. Um, I just don't really want to go there and be like, 
yeah, I'm small and I can't like compete. So hopefully I like try my hardest and me and my team try to win a medal. Anna's talent was spotted early. She first picked up a bat aged five and was taken to China to learn from the best when she could barely see over the table. Since then, she's been coached closer to home in Cardiff. Probably the best 11 year old I've ever seen. You know, boys and girls, she's up there with, I remember seeing Paul Drinkle, who's um, number one in the UK right now, man, and she's up there. When I saw him at 11, she's at that level. You know, amazing. Oh my gosh, she can do two at the same time. That's just amazing. Anna is celebrating her exciting news at school today, teaching her friends how to play table tennis. She'll have to miss lessons to go to the games in Australia, but already thought to be one of the youngest competitors ever at this level, she will make history if she does win a medal there. And in tennis, Roger Federer has continued to show why he is now the favourite to take out the Australian Open men's title. The 36-year-old veteran romped into the semi-finals after beating Tomas Burdic in straight sets to book his place for the 14th time in his career. Yeah. He's done it and Roger Federer oh. keeps his impeccable six, record here seven, six, in quarter-finals six, three, at the Australian six, Open. Yes, the Swiss maestro now faces Korean Hyon Chung, who earlier beat American Tina Sandgren to become the first South Korean to qualify for a Grand Slam semi. Although Federer did have something to admit about the 21-year-old. I haven't really seen him play that much, to be quite honest, for some reason. I don't know why, where he's been playing and where I've been playing. Well, I don't play so much, so there you have it. <laughs> That's my bad, but uh, no, he's uh, incredibly impressive. In the men's doubles, Kiwi hopeful Marcus Daniel has failed to make it past the quarterfinals, while world number one Simona Halep has continued her domination in the women's draw. And Halep in ominous form. The Romanian sets up a mouth-watering semi-final clash with Angelique Kerber. And to golf, Tiger is back to his first start on the USA US PGA Tour in a year. He'll tee off at the Farmers Insurance Open at Tolly Pines, the same course where he celebrated his last win nine years ago. Tory Pines was once described as Tiger Woods' personal playground, and he's hoping to make it his happy hunting ground again. No, no more pain in my back. My back is fused. <laughs> After recovering from his fourth back surgery, the former world number one's back competing with the big boys again. I just want to start playing on the tour and get into a rhythm of playing a schedule again. I haven't, I haven't done that in such a long time, so I, I don't know what to expect. It's been a year since he's played a full field tournament. The 42-year-old slipping down the rankings to 647th in the world. When I came back off my ACL injury in, in 08, and I started playing 09. It was nine months, uh, but I had been playing a full schedule prior to that. And you know, here I haven't played a full schedule since 2015. He's returning to the scene of his US Open win in 2008, the last of his 14 majors. I don't know what the number is going to be. I'm usually pretty good at calling the number before the tournament starts, but I haven't seen a lot of these young guys play. It seems everyone has an opinion on Tiger's comeback. Former coach Hank Haney thinks his old pupil still has what it takes, predicting a top 10 finish this weekend. Four-time major winner Rory McIlroy has no doubt Woods can stun the world again. But Masters champion Sergio Garcia is not confident, questioning Woods' ageing body. The Spaniard will need to get used to seeing his old sparring partner again. Yes, I was, I'm looking forward to playing a full schedule and getting ready for the Masters. Woods' return to Augusta National is still three months away. We'll see if he can master Tory Pines when he tees off tomorrow. And that wraps up Trukai Sports. I'll be back with the weather details after the break. Trukai Sports. Trukai Sports. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. With doing with Dulux. Weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in the southern region: monsoon rain, moderate to strong northwest winds in Port Moresby, rain showers and monsoon rain in Daru and Kerama, 
Monsoon rain with moderate northwest winds in Alutau and Popendita. In the Momase region, rain in Leh and rain showers in Wiwek, Vanimo and Medang. In the New Guinea Islands region, experiencing rain showers with moderate to strong northwest winds, Loringao, KVN, Kokopo, Rabao, Kimbe and Buka. And in the Highlands region, monsoon rain in Mount Hagen, rain in Groka, Kundiawa, Mendi and Wabeg. Forecast for small ships for the next 24 hours, strong wind warning current for all coastal waters of Papua New Guinea, gale wind warning current for all coastal waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait and Daru, Kiwai Island to Kerma, Yule Island to Hood Point, to all Milne Bay Islands, including Finchhafen to Vitia Strait, CSC Island to Long Island and Medang, also New Britain to New Island and Bougainville. Waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait and Daru to Kiwai Island, Kerma to Yule Island to Hood Point and Samari Island, seas of 2.5 to 3.5 meters. Waters of Samari Island to Cape Vogel to Finchhafen, seas of 2.5 to 3 meters. Waters of Finchhafen to Vitias Dampier Strait to CSC Islands, Long Island to Medang, seas of 2.5 to 3.5 meters. Waters of Medang to Bogia, Wiwek to Aitape, Vanimo and Northern PNG Indonesian border, seas of 2.5 to 3 meters. Waters of Manus and its western group of islands, seas of 2.5 to 3 meters. And waters of New Island to New Britain to Bougainville, seas of 2.5 to 3.5 meters. Ocean forecast for PNG areas in the Coral Sea, seas rough with southwest winds at 30 to 48 knots. In the Solomon Sea, seas rough with northwest winds at 30 to 34 knots. In the Bismarck Sea, seas rough with northwest winds at 30 to 34 knots. And in the Pacific Ocean, seas rough with northeast to northwest winds at 30 to 34 knots. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. Worth doing with Dulux. And before we go, here's a recap of our main stories for tonight. Agriculture Minister concerned over importing of needed pesticides for agriculture industry. Central Province Rice Project back in the spotlight as TIPNG calls for transparency in decisions and RSPCA gets much needed clinic to care for cities' animals. And that's the way it is for the new sports and weather for today, Saturday, January 27th, 2018. On behalf of the entire MTV National News Team, pleasant viewing. Good night.